Okay, so I think we'll um, we'll begin. Welcome to this March Shack online online seminar, our continuing series, which began during the pandemic, and we've decided um, to continue. Could everybody go to mute, please, apart from the speaker, that is, um, and. Alison will talk for sort of 20 to 30 minutes and then there'll be a sort of 30 minutes uh, of moderated discussion. Those of you who are on the Zoom, uh, please put your questions in the chat box and I'll call you to ask them uh, as and when. Those of you who are on YouTube, if you could put the, your questions in chat box, then they'll be passed uh, to me for me, me to ask. It's sort of one of the peculiarities of the way this sort of software works. Uh, so this month, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Alison McManus, uh, who is um, recently admitted Associate Professor in the Department of History of Science and Technology at Johns Hopkins University, having obtained her PhD um, earlier this year, as it happens, so I can't, can't be that long, long ago now, um, uh, from Princeton. Uh, her dissertation was entitled The Other Chemists' War, the uses, dual uses and abuses of chemical weapons in the Second World War, a transnational study of chemical weapons research and development, which highlights secrecy and information control when it comes to two new classes of chemical agents. First, the plant hormone herbicides we now call Agent Orange, and two, the G series nerve agents, and she'll be presenting on some of that um, latter work shortly. Um, she's written, she's also written on scientific publication during the 1939-45 war and is the former postgraduate uh, Shack representative and, uh, as she puts it here, maintains an abiding interest in the history of chemistry. Uh, the title of Addison's talk is on the screen, so over, you, over to you, Alison. Thanks very much for the introduction, Frank, as well as for inviting me to speak with you today. I'll be presenting a chapter of my current book project, which deals with chemical weapons research development and intelligence gathering in the context of the Second World War. Now, the compounds that I now show on the screen are the most conspicuous contributions of chemical weapons researchers during the war. These are the G-series nerve agents, Tabin, Sarin, and Soman, all developed under Nazi Germany. The nerve gases are one prominent example of how the events of the Second World War changed the history of chemical weapons, despite sometimes being skipped over as a case of chemical weapons, quote unquote, non-use. Now, my focus today is not on the more famous example of Nazi nerve gases, but rather the story of those who tried to ensure that they were keeping up with the robust German chemical industry at the time, namely the British researchers at Cambridge University, as well as Porton Down. During the war, they conducted chemical screening programs to identify promising agents. They performed field trials. They collaborated with their American colleagues. And they actually came very, very close to the chemical structures of tabin and sarin, proposing a synthesis of this molecule here. And they did so without really ever knowing how consequential those small structural differences were and how far behind they actually were in terms of military preparedness as a result of these small differences. In fact, these Nazi superweapons remained unknown to the Allies until the very last month of the European war, even though the British and the Americans had both received credible intelligence reports about those compounds nearly two years prior. So it's a curious story of being close to a chemical structure, but not quite there, of having access to chemical intelligence, but not fully recognizing its significance. The reasons for this near miss, I would argue, have institutional and economic as well as epistemological dimensions. On a very practical level, economic pressure and institutional priorities pushed researchers away from chemical surveys in favor of more pressing problems. And on an epistemological level, interpreting chemical intelligence was just a very fraught endeavor. It was a matter of educated guesswork, which drew heavily on research experience, sometimes very idiosyncratic research experience. Prior encounters with very similar molecules could and did sometimes lead chemists astray. And that's indeed what happened to British nerve gas researchers during the war. <laughs> 
Now, I'll begin by giving a bit of background on the agents in question, um, starting before they were secret in the first place. Now, nerve gases are strongly associated with the Nazi regime. They were not, however, a Nazi invention. The first published account of organophosphorus nerve agents actually came out of academic research at the University of Berlin in the early 1930s. Two German chemists, Willi Lange and his PhD student, Gerda von Kruger, published an article that drew attention to these two compounds shown on the middle of the screen. Uh, they referred to them by their technical name, that is dialkyl esters of monofluorophosphoric acids, um, essentially both derivatives of the smaller molecule shown on the bottom of the screen uh, with two alkyl groups of differing sizes. And in this 1932 article, the authors described some unusual physiological impacts of these chemicals. They noted shortness of breath, blurrings of consciousness, and symptoms of blindness that lasted several hours, um, all of which garnered attention among the international chemical community. And this basic molecular structure would continue to influence nerve gas research, especially in the British context going forward. But as for the two authors of the paper, they actually went very separate ways. Von Kruger finished her PhD and she moved on to unrelated research problems. Lange's story took a much more troubling turn. In 1933, just a year after this publication, the University of Berlin fired Lange from his position on the grounds that his wife, also a chemist, was Jewish. He later found some employment at a chemical firm in Western Germany and worked there for about six years. But Fortunately, he and his wife both fled to the United States in 1939. I know that Lange continued to work on fluorinated organophosphate chemistry while in the United States, and I'm in the process of figuring out whether he ever did so on behalf of the U.S. government. And meanwhile, back in Germany, the 33-year-old organic chemist Gerhard Schrader synthesized a novel toxic compound just a couple of days before Christmas in 1936. At the time, he had been looking for a new insecticide, which he hoped would benefit German agriculture and become a commercial boon to his employer, the chemical conglomerate IG Farben. But almost immediately after taking a whiff of this new compound, Schrader experienced some neurological symptoms, including pinpoint pupils, shortness of breath, headache, and so on, that only subsided after a couple of days. Later tests at Ige's toxicological laboratories confirmed that the compound was just far too poisonous to mammals to justify developing it as an insecticide. It was, however, exactly the kind of compound that piqued the interest of Nazi military planners, who worked with Ige Farben's leadership to mass produce the agent. It's worth noting that Schrader was quite involved in the process. Uh, he advised military chemists on their pilot plants. He synthesized a second compound, sarin, in 1938, which was even more potent than the first and also aided in pilot plant production. Now, finally, the last of the G-series nerve agents developed during the war is Somon, uh, which was synthesized by the biochemist Richard Kuhn, then director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Medical Research in Heidelberg. He looked at this research problem explicitly at the direction of army officials, although far too late to affect German war planning. Now, of the three agents shown on the screen, only Tabin on the left was produced in quantities sufficient for combat use. And even when it was ready, Hitler never ordered that it be deployed. This brings up the issue of chemical weapons restraint, which is a fraught question a bit beyond the scope of this talk. I will flag one contributing factor uh, having to do with in uh, chemical intelligence, and that's the question of the Tabin monopoly, right? We now know that Nazi Germany was the only nation with working nerve gas weapons at the end of the war, but the regime, of course, didn't know that for certain and might have been more cautious because of it. What they did know for certain was that nerve gas research was a transnational story. Work proceeded expeditiously in the US, the Soviet Union, as well as in Britain, our primary national context for today. Now, with the outbreak of the war, the British Ministry of Supply organized an extramural research team to tackle chemical weapons research and to liaise with the government's primary chemical weapons facilities at Porton Down in Wiltshire. Cambridge University was in many ways the center of this extramural universe. Uh, the Ministry of Supply contacted a team of researchers at the University Chemical Laboratory, uh, which was led by Bernard Saunders and Hamilton McCombe. Now, the, later, the latter figure, Hamilton McCombe, he didn't leave many photographic traces, um, but he has an interesting biography because he was no stranger at all to matters of chemical, bi of chemical warfare. He had fought 
in the Special Gas Brigade during the First World War and briefly served as chemical advisor during the interwar occupation of Germany as well. And the Saunders Macambi team worked on a variety of problems during the war. They worked on detection, on optimizing production. They devoted a lot of time to chemical surveys, synthesizing a battery of organophosphorus compounds and sending them for further evaluation at a neighboring institution at Cambridge, the University Physiological Laboratory. The leader of this research group was Edgar Adrian. Um, he was a Nobel laureate, an expert on neurons, and fun fact, also a distant relative of David Hume, although I should note by marriage. And what you should know about this collaboration is that it was very efficient, very close. Uh, Saunders noted that it was often possible to test a compound's physiological properties within just a few hours of its synthesis, making their chemical screening program just about as efficient as possible. And that's important uh, because efficiency in chemical screening is absolutely necessary in this time period. Um, around the same time, a German chemist estimated that about one in every 1,000 compounds tested was actually suitable for use as a chemical weapon. The vast majority would not even move past the laboratory stage into field trials. Uh, just by way of illustration, this document on the right is a post-war reconstruction of how chemical screenings proceeded in the German context during the war. Notice that 900 substances were discarded after the first toxicological tests alone. So given these numbers, scientists certainly had tempered expectations when it came to the development of novel weapons. And on top of that, there was a broader perception that not only were chemical weapons incredibly difficult to find, they were not likely to improve drastically on existing agents. This was summed up by science advisor and biologist J.B.S. Haldane, who wrote in 1925 that chemical weapons of the future would be, quote, not so very unlike those of the past. Similarly, James Kendall, a chemistry professor and former liaison officer on chemical warfare, wrote in 1939 that just as one would not expect a runner to beat the record mile time by an entire one minute margin, so too would a scientist not expect a new chemical weapon to be drastically more toxic or more effective in battle than existing technologies. So Cambridge scientists carrying out chemical surveys probably expected to tinker and improve toxicity slowly. And they appeared to make some real progress in December of 1941. McCombie and Saunders synthesized this molecule uh, called diisopropyl fluorophosphonate, or DFP for short, also PF3 as a code name in the United States. Um, now, it's fairly clear that they were working off of Lange and von Kruger's example. Uh, you'll notice that this molecule differs from theirs by just two methyl groups. And initially, this compound did look like a promising new weapon. The physiological laboratory noted that these are high, highly toxic as lethal inhalants, right? Um, they found that it was capable of killing mice, rats, and rabbits um, in just one part per 10,000. They also staged chamber tests on humans using, of course, a sublethal concentration, and they found that DFP caused pinpoint pupils at just one part per million. So this was the first compound of considerable interest for the Cambridge scientists. But it soon fell out of favor. Um, Port and Down personnel carried out further larger scale tests and determined that in order to get truly harassing effects on humans, such as shortness of breath or a significant reduction in vision, you had to achieve a very high concentration in the field and this was not physically possible. So in quick succession, we get far less positive evaluations of this substance, experts noting that its value as a chemical weapon is, quote, extremely doubtful. Um, note here that they're actually speaking about the entire class of alkyl fluorophosphates, um, since DFP was considered to be the best of the bunch. We also get the official statement by Porton that DFP was, quote, of considerable academic interest, but of little interest in chemical warfare. Similar tests also took place in the US and the chemical was also discarded there. And this perception held until allied forces received a new piece of chemical intelligence. As British troops advanced through Tunisia in May of 1943, they captured a German soldier by the name of Hermann Hoch, uh, who coincidentally had also worked for the Army Gas Protection Laboratory in the Spandau Citadel, shown on the right. This was an imposing medieval fortress that sat at the intersection of the Spree and Havel rivers on the outskirts of Berlin, which the Nazis had converted into a research facility for matters of chemical warfare. <laughs> 
This was also the location of pilot plants for both Tabin and Sarin. Now, Hoff had direct experience with these agents. Um, he knew that they were called Trilons. Um, this was chosen after a popular brand of detergent in order to confuse allied intelligence, right? He also knew that a worker had died from exposure to these chemicals. And most concerningly, he knew that at least one of them had gone past the pilot plant stage and was ready for combat use. He did not, however, know their chemical structure. This was information that was deliberately withheld from him, despite the fact that he worked on detecting the compound. Um, Hoch could really only say that they were alkyl esters of monofluorophosphate, so something like this. Notably, he wasn't sure if they were mono or diesters, and he didn't know the identity of any substituents labeled R or R prime in these diagrams, although he said that they probably had less than six carbon atoms. So he gave interrogators a problem of chemical combinatorics. Well over 100 compounds fit this description, including, of course, DFP, the compound that British and American scientists had already tested and discarded. Now, in some interrogators just weren't sure what to make of their informant's stories. This was not the first time that they had heard of Nazi nerve poisons. Uh, the U.S. Chemical Warfare Service, for instance, collected several reports of undetectable gases that would paralyze soldiers, allegedly. Uh, one intelligence officer became so frustrated with these rumors that she derided them as, quote, the usual colorless, odorless nerve gas story. On top of that, Allied interrogators also had to contend with the soldiers' questionable character and reliability. Uh, one officer noted that he was, quote, hardly to be classified as a trained scientist, suspected he had merely exaggerated his capabilities in order to obtain employment in Britain and the United States. And to further complicate matters, the prisoner admitted to having lied to interrogators in the past. Um, after he was transferred from British to American custody, he bragged to his um, American officers, saying essentially, I am a chemist, you know, I have sufficient knowledge that I could conjure up a fictional chemical warfare agent, draw up its structure for you, describe it well enough that interrogators just wouldn't know that I'm lying. Um, and as he put it to the American officer, quote, I once permitted myself such a joke in London. In some, separating fact from rumor hinged in part on evaluating the trustworthiness of the source. It also required chemists to draw from their own research experience. One of the things that I'd like to convey about information control in science is that when practitioners encountered information voids, for instance, a very nonspecific description of chemical structure, they tended to project based on their own experience. And in order to interpret the validity of Hoch's testimony, experts at Port and Down drew from what they already knew about diesters of monofluorophosphate. Um, they noted that Hoch had probably worked with a diester because in their experience, monoesters were much more difficult to prepare. They also just weren't sure what to make of Hoch's description of toxicity. He had told them, for instance, um, that concentrations as low as one-tenth of a milligram per cubic meter of Trilon could cause symptoms in soldiers. Um, and this was about 1,000 more times more toxic than what British interrogators had expected, uh, given their previous experience with DFP. And this, interestingly enough, led them to suggest that a unit error was a likely explanation for the discrepancy that he had merely swapped cubic meters and liters. Um, it seemed more likely that he had made this error than that the German chemists had actually developed a compound as poisonous as Hawk said they did. But it's crucial to note here that British experts also considered the possibility that they had been wrong about DFP in the first place. Uh, they authorized further trials at Port and Down, which gave mixed results. In July, a follow-up Porton paper concluded again that the threshold for toxic action of DFP was rather high but that it could possibly be used as a ground contamination weapon, which might produce effects over a long period of time. And since this was a possibility, they recommended further research into methods of detection and treatment for DFP. Around the same time, the Ministry of Supply also called an ad hoc meeting among members of the chemical weapons extramural research team. The question, on the table was whether and how to alter research priorities in light of the prisoner's statements on the Trilons and recent experiments with DFP at Port and Down. This was very much a contentious meeting. The biggest issue was whether to continue chemical surveys of fluorinated organophosphates as McCombie Saunders and Adrian had been doing since 1941. 
Military personnel in general were not in favor of continued surveys. They rather recommended intensified work in detection and treatment. Theirs was very much a practical bent, as the chairman of the Chemical Defense Experiment Station put it, Britain simply did not have the resources necessary to bring a new chemical agent all the way from the laboratory stage to mass production and combat readiness. Uh, he noted bluntly it is wishful thinking, right? And even when it came to smaller scale laboratory work, these took resources as well. Most chemists and biochemists were already enrolled in war work of one kind or another meaning that a continued survey would necessarily be limited in scope and that its chances of success would therefore be very small. At the same time, the Cambridge science scientists present at the meeting had their hearts set on continuing their survey work. Reading between the lines, I think it was probably the physiologist Adrian and the chemist McCombie who persuaded the military officers present at the meeting. And they ultimately reached the compromise that quote, detection work had the highest priority and the search for new compounds would continue at a lower priority. And so the Cambridge scientists doggedly continued their chemical surveys. Um, at this point, they were also helped along by an American chemist by the name of Anton Berg, who worked for the Office of Scientific Research and Development on Organophosphorus Compounds. Um, he prepared this compound here, shown on the lower left, a diaminophosphoryl fluoride, which he gave the code name T- 2002. Um, you'll notice that it's analogous to DFP, except with amino groups rather than alkyl esters. Now, Berg noticed that this new compound was surprisingly toxic, and so he sent this information to his British counterparts under a pre-existing official agreement to exchange chemical data. This together prompted McCombie and Saunders to wonder if they might actually combine DFP and Berg's new model molecule into a hybrid compound, uh, which they called compound five. <laughs> now they drew its structure and they designated it a compound of considerable interest in December of 1943. They never actually prepared it in the laboratory. Um, this was the closest that British chemists ever got to independently synthesizing one of the G-series nerve agents during the war. You'll notice that in addition to being a structural hybrid of DFP and T2002, um, compound five is a hybrid of tabin and sarin. So this near miss got a lot of attention among personnel at Porton Down after the war, with one officer writing, it will not escape notice how near the British workers were to obtaining tabin. And given their strong interest in this compound five, it brings up the question of why McCombie and Saunders were actually unable to prepare it in the laboratory. Problems with synthesis might very well have slowed them down. Further communication from Porton probably played a role as well. I was working in the archives one day when I came upon a very caustic letter, which was sent the following March um, to Porton's extramural researchers, basically stating it has come to our attention that certain contracted researchers are not following priority programs. Um, that again, they had decided that methods of detection and treatment were paramount and that studies of new compounds were supposed to continue at a lower priority. But now that that rule had been broken, Porton leadership declared that work on new gases should stop entirely. The memo noted that despite much intensive research on new gases in recent years, very few real possibilities have emerged, and that the field had been covered so comprehensively that it was really very unlikely that an outstanding compound had been overlooked. There's this idea that researchers had such a good grasp of this particular chunk of the chemical universe that they just wouldn't be substantially surprised anymore. And so the memo concluded that any further search should be left entirely to the United States, uh, citing their greater resources of technical manpower and that British chemists should only investigate new compounds if and when their American counterparts identified an especially promising one. This memo, I believe, was the death of McCombie's compound of considerable interest. A little over a year later, however, British troops made a discovery that once again forced them to reevaluate their position on the organophosphates. <laughs> 
Advancing British troops in Nordrhein-Westfalia happened upon an abandoned munitions dump containing gas shells with unknown markings. They later discovered pilot plants for Tabin and Sarin as well, which had been evacuated west from Spandau in advance of the Soviet occupation of Berlin. Now, in both cases, British soldiers collected samples, sent them to field laboratories, and shared them with American chemists. Um, but surprisingly, it still took some time for them to sound the alarm. Initially, chemists were working with a degraded sample, which was nowhere near as poisonous as the original compound. And moreover, their previous experience with DFP continued to inform their analysis of this new German agent and contributed to broader skepticism about its utility. In fact, more than a month after the discovery of these shells, an American lieutenant colonel of the Chemical Warfare Service remarked that the similarity between this new agent and DFP indicated that Tabin was, at best, a harassing agent. Um, over the following summer, a fuller picture of Tabin did finally emerge. Intelligence officers associated with the ALZOS mission, as well as the Combined Intelligence Objective Subcommittee, captured and interrogated German chemists like Kuhn and Schrader ultimately driving home the importance of these new compounds. Uh, personnel also connected field trials with these captured munitions. Um, and in so doing, they actually reused test facilities at Graubkammer, um, a German military site. And they were also able to confirm that these were in fact deadly agents. So as the European war came to an end, the question on the minds of many British officers and scientists was, how was it that we got so close to these agents and yet not all the way there? On the one hand, it was a point of pride for some that they had gotten so close. Um, I noted earlier the Porton official who was so eager to reference McCombie and Saunders' proposal of Compound 5. But as you can imagine, it was also a matter of embarrassment for intelligence officers that these German nerve agents had been right under their noses, so to speak, and they had still failed to appreciate their full significance. Um, the chemist and historical writer Dan Cassetta quoted a British official, it's an excellent quote, who described this whole episode as the one time we were really caught with our trousers down. So it's worth thinking a bit about how British scientists ended up close and far at once. Firstly, it's clear from the record uh, that Porton and its extramural scientists had different research and development priorities. Contracted researchers like McCombie, Saunders, and Adrian were keen to continue their chemical surveys, even against the advice of government officials. They're not on the record saying why. Um, I suspect it had something to do with their pre-existing research traditions, wide-ranging molecular surveys being, of course, a central part of organic chemistry and biochemistry at this time and also a reliable means of making slow progress uh, that McCombie and his colleagues probably believed would aid their country in war. But in contrast, Porton officials were more interested in problems immediately applicable to a potential future chemical war. Matters of treatment and detection, for instance, as well as improvements to existing chemical agents, means of production, delivery, and so on. This is consistent with the broader expectation that chemical weapons of the future would be not so very unlike those of the past, as JBS Haldane put it in the interwar period. And so you can see Porton making the argument that it's better to improve what you have than conduct an expensive search for something new if the thing that already exists works just fine. On a related note, economic considerations also pushed the British military toward a more pragmatic approach. Scarcity of trained chemists meant that broad ranging chemical surveys were a luxury compared to research in detection and therapy. Industrial production of a novel agent was even more far fetched and certainly wouldn't result in a combat ready weapon anytime soon. So to use an old construction, it didn't make much sense to advocate pure research, so to speak, if you knew ahead of time that you just didn't have time, money, and material to carry out its application. But I would note that there are epistemological factors at work here too, which cut right to the central role of experience and experiment in making sense of chemical knowledge claims. Experience, in a word, was a way of making sense of uncertainty. When researchers confronted an informational void, they often projected their own research experience, filling in gaps with the molecules they already knew. On the Allied side, the similarity between DFP and the rumored Trilon gas led chemists to read Hoff's reports with an especially skeptical eye. And similar skepticism persisted even after Allied chemists recovered a physical sample of the new weapon. 
On both of these occasions, chemists struggled to reconcile new information with their previous experience of the compounds in question. It's worth noting that they didn't outright reject surprising information. They actually took a more conservative approach and advocated further experimental work. Sometimes that meant a repeat of a field test. Sometimes that meant a broader ranging chemical survey. But a further complication of that approach was the problem of small structural differences, right? As military chemists, of course, knew all too well from their many, many rejected compounds, the success or failure of a weapons program rested on really minute structural variations, uh, meaning that when a captured German chemist gave general information about a broad class of compounds, the only sure way to evaluate its validity was to conduct a comprehensive chemical survey. The quick way of evaluating it, of course, was to draw from one's own research experience. In sum, chemical intelligence required experiment to prove. Experiment was highly sensitive to the vicissitudes of molecular difference. And overall, experiment was not always an option. Thanks very much again for the invitation um, to these institutions and funding agencies, um, as well as to these scholars who have helped me think through nerve gas research um, and the role of information control in science. I'd be very happy to take any questions you have, and I look forward to discussion. Well, thank, thank you, Alison. That was absolutely fascinating and super. Uh, prompts all sorts of questions. Um, I will exercise my normal chair's prerogative and ask the um, first question while people put their thoughts, questions, requests to ask questions in the um, in the chat room. And same for uh, those of you who are on uh, YouTube. Um, so perhaps I could sort of start by asking who were actually the interrogators? Uh, when, when Herman Hock fell into Allied hands, who did they actually send? Were it sort of military officers with lots of scientific training or military officers who've been to sort of Sandhurst and given six months of chemistry or perhaps even less to ask the, ask the question? Because, I mean, one of the reasons why he might, the, the way they interpreted his evidence uh, is that the officers who were doing the interrogation didn't actually quite know what the questions were. They didn't know what the questions were. They didn't actually know what the answers meant. That's a great question. Um, so the interrogators were, first off, both British and American. Um, initially, he was subject to a couple of weeks of interrogation in British custody. Um, and in addition to interrogating him, they asked him to translate um, decontamination manuals from German into English. Um, in terms of the training of the officers, my sense is that they had a good level of chemical knowledge. I'm afraid I can't speculate um, as to the, the length of their experience in chemistry, but they were asking very detailed questions. Um, and importantly, they were calling in additional experts where necessary. Um, so the recognizing the limitations of uh, one's own knowledge base was an important consideration here too. So for instance, after British and American um, intelligence officers from say uh, the chemical warfare service had finished um, talking to the prisoner directly, they sent their reports to experts at Porton Down and had contracted researchers weigh in. Okay. Right, so we've got three questions coming through. Uh, so Alex Angerhofer first, please. Yes, very, very interesting talk. So I'm curious what happened to the German scientists. I'm assuming that Kuhn and Schrader were not the only ones that were working on, on these nerve agents. And I'm assuming they, they got debriefed. Um, did they assist allied forces or allied scientists in developing these nerve agents further and reconstructing the German efforts? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's very much related to Project Paperclip, the um, allied effort to recruit uh, German scientists on um, all sorts of um, scientific problems ranging from, um, say, uh, rockets to biological warfare to chemical warfare in this case. Um, now, as far as the fate of German chemists working on this problem, it depended a little bit on um, their career position. 
So the managers at IG Faben, um, as you can imagine, were much more complicit in Nazi war crimes, um, and uh, many of them were jailed uh, for this reason after the Nuremberg trials. Um, in terms of the relatively lower ranking researchers like uh, Gerhard Schrader, for instance, um, he actually worked for the Allies after the war. Um, he worked on organophosphorus insecticides, so the nature of his work did not change very much um, at all before and after the war. Okay, Brian Barmer next. Hi, Alison. Thank you. That was such a fascinating talk. Um, um, my recollection is Schrader was forced to give his information over under law, wasn't he, to the, for, as he was working on pesticides. And later with the V agents, there were in, in the UK, there were informal and um, sorry, formal and informal links made with the industry. And I wondered mm -hmm. what sort mm -hmm. of contact there was between Porton and industry during World War II. Were there any formal or informal arrangements to alert them to new compounds? Yes, yes uh, excellent question. Um, now, it's a two part question. I'll answer the German context first. Uh, the Nazi state learned of uh, Schroeder's new compound through two different channels. Um, one, not surprisingly, was the patent office. Um, so when researchers um, prepared a patent, sent it to the Reichspatentamt, um, they were authorized to forward any potentially toxic compounds to the military authorities. That actually didn't have to happen um, in uh, Schroeder's case because one of his um, higher ranking colleagues, a chemist by the name of Heinrich Hörlein, um, was interested in the toxicological data and he took it upon himself to contact the military on his own accord. Um, so there were informal channels and there were also very formal channels. Um, and uh, the secret patent is of course a key tool um, in this transfer of, of information. Um, so to use the example of uh, Macambi and Saunders, um, they had a number of secret patents taken out during the war, um, syntheses of alkyl fluorophosphates. Um, and reading between the lines, that's um, uh, one way um, that uh, important researchers could have learned um, of similar toxic molecules. Um, however, in this case, they learned of it through normal contract work. Thanks. John Christie next, John. Thanks very much. A brilliant paper, I thought, uh, Alison. I've got a quick comment, first of all, and, and, and then a question. The comment is on someone uh, who appeared very briefly early on in your talk, James Kendall. Yeah. Oh, who I think is a very interesting figure. Uh, I actually first came across him because he's actually quite a good historian of chemistry or uh -huh. became, became such. Um, but in the period you're looking at, uh, 1937, 1938, uh, there seems to be a big uh, kind of uh, public oncoming war scare. Uh, yes. which was to do with the danger of kind of area saturation, poison gas bombing. And he wrote uh, quickly uh, a book to try and calm public opinion, a book called uh, Breathe Freely. Um, and uh, uh, so he strikes me as very much a more public figure than some of these others uh, uh, you've mm. been talking about, uh, uh, very, very visible. But his expertise was more on, as it were, poison gases, looking back to First World War poison gases and gas mask technology rather than, I think, nerve agents. Yeah. Then he, exactly. to, uh, then he, he moved to Edinburgh to be professor there, I think. Yeah. Um, my question is uh, is to do with uh, sources, archives and access, Alison. Could you just talk about it a bit? Um, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, are there, uh, is your main archive portent down? Uh, do you learn about the Cambridge group from the Porton archive? Um, is there a higher bureaucracy involved in the War Office in London? Uh, do bureaucrats 
pick these people out? Um, how, how does that sort of thing work and how, how easy or difficult was access to these really quite sensitive sources? It's an interesting question. Um, and if you had asked me 20 years ago, I would have answered it differently and not differently in the way that you would think. So many of the uh, documents um, held in, in my home country on wartime uh, nerve gas research were reclassified after 9-11. So they had uh, gone through a period of uh, more opening up and, and closing it down again. Um, a very similar thing happened in Russia, for instance. Now, I don't work on the Russian context primarily for reasons of, of language, um, but immediately after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a, an opening up of uh, limited archival records. Um, and I, I have heard um, stories here and there of folks being able to access more information, um, but only, only temporarily. Mm. Um, I'll also note that in terms of accessing sources, um, Porton is my primary um, archival source, um, but I'm also making use of um, archival sources from the British Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee, from the ALZOS mission, from the Combined Intelligence Objectives Subcommittee. Um, the most reliable way or really one of the only remaining ways of getting information about uh, German work on nerve gas is through these interrogation reports because so many of the original documents were um, destroyed uh, in advance of the allied occupation. Gosh, um, there's a lot that we could talk about um, in terms of access. Um, I think I'm going to pick up on your your other question of how it was that um, Porton recruited uh, scientists. Um, what I see a large amount of is actually scientists volunteering um, at the physiological laboratory in particular um, when the war started. Scientists sat down and uh, wrote down the skills that they thought would be of use um, in the war context and they um, right. sent it uh, to the British government um, and some of them were were picked that way. Thank you very much Alison, that was uh, uh, exceptionally informative, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, John Walker next, John. Hi, Alison. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, my question concerns the following. In start of the Second World War, Britain took a hell of a long time, actually, to start making uh, mustard and phosgene. And it's yeah. the time that the RAF got new weapons, which were shipped out to India for possible use in the Pacific uh, against the Japanese, um, the war was nearing its end. So do you think this awareness of the problems of weaponizing and stockpiling chemical warfare agents was one of the reasons why there was very little interest in new agent research uh, in the middle 1940s. Um, and just going back in time, I mean, for most of the interwar period, the British programme had been very largely focused purely on defensive activities rather than new agent research. It's a good question. Yes, uh, it's, it's absolutely the case that the British chemical weapons program was focused on defensive research. Um, that's the case in France. I believe it's also the case um, in, in the United States, although not to the same extent. Um, there are some definite concerns um, about weaponizing uh, poison gases during this time period. Um, there's the issue of finding a chemical that doesn't simply degrade um, when it uh, experiences the high heat of a, an explosive blast. There's the issue of how do you actually um, obtain a uh, workable concentration um, in field conditions. And I think that as the context of war shifted from the ground to the air, that these difficulties were really compounded, right? Um, so to add to that, during this time period, uh, a mustard gas bomb would do, say, significantly less damage than a conventional explosive bomb. 
And I think that accounts for some of the skepticism toward new weapons. I, I cited um, before a couple of um, figures saying that probably chemical weapons would not um, experience a substantial um, improvement in the next few years of research. And if they were already a bit more problematic or substantially more problematic than conventional explosives, I think that's a, a definite um, reason for a government strapped for resources to be skeptical of this work. Okay, thank you. Um, next up is Felix Driver. Felix. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Alison. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, my question is quite a broad one. It's about um, interactions between British chemists and German mm -hmm. chemists in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So whether you know of any um, connections with Schrader in particular or, or people at Heidelberg and whether the War Office drew on that. Then my reason for asking is I have a close relative who was a chemist in the War Office. This relates actually to John wow. Christie's question. Uh -huh. um, about the sort of other point in the triangle. And he, he was involved in interrogation in 1945 mm -hmm. uh, of IG Farben uh, chemists. Um, and he was also at Cambridge. Uh, he moved to Cambridge in 1938. So he's clearly probably a quite a small player in all of this, but, but it did make me, I think he went into war office quite early. So um, it made me wonder about the war office side of things but also more, more generally connections in German and British chemists, because I know he traveled to Germany in the 1930s. Oh, wow. That's a really great question and one that I would like to learn more about. The example that comes to mind um, is uh, William Feldberg, or originally Wilhelm Feldberg, and he was working in the physiology laboratory uh, that I cite in this paper. Um, the typical story of course, is, is Lange's story. It's Feldberg's story. It's the story of the German Jewish refugee scientist that flees the country um, and proceeds to do research, whether it's in physics or chemistry or another scientific discipline um, on behalf of uh, the country that took them in as a refugee. Um, chemistry is very much an international field in the 1930s. Um, and I heard a story of um, some of the British interrogators, um, you know, it's, it's surprising, but in some ways uh, having a good rapport um, with uh, the chemists that they interrogated because many of them had been colleagues and had worked in the same institutions uh, prior to the war. I don't know um, if that made it easier to get information out of them. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't, um, but it's an interesting angle uh, to think about. Could I just come back briefly? Yeah, yes, I think uh, I'm an amateur in this area, but I did read in the archives a description of one of these interrogations as like a PhD viva. Uh, ah, I think wow. uh, I think this <laughs> I think it was in the course of trying to work out how they would approach the interrogation. And I think that came from an academic chemist. Oh, that's fascinating. I can imagine. Much okay. longer than a PhD viva as well. Depends where you're examined, actually. I suppose. Um, um, can I sort of follow up on, on both John and Felix's points and ask about the sort of administration of this? Uh, have I got it right that Port and Down commissioned people like Lord Adrian to do research in Cambridge and had problems sort of making sure they were doing the sort of work that Port and Down wanted to do. And then that sort of raises all sorts of questions about the role of the Ministry of Supply, the Royal Society of London's list of scientific manpower that was being drawn together in 1938-39. Um, so as, as, as uh, all sorts of institutions sort of getting ready for war and then when war comes sort of starting to implement the ideas um and i can't imagine adrian being the sort of person who would take kindly to being told by civil servants from the ministry of supply or the ministry of war um what to do i also thought it wonderful that he was a relation of hume i never knew that i never knew that before i have to say <laughs> 
<laughs> John is John is John is laughing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, um, a very interesting philosopher, I think, for a, a chemist or physiologist to be related to, for sure. Um, that was my interpretation of Adrian as well. Um, I, I didn't want to be necessarily too cynical about it, but I can totally see how, you know, he's a very prominent scientist, a Nobel laureate, and does not want to be told what to do, does not want to be told uh, that someone else knows um, how science should be done. Um, I would have to look at, you know, I, I wish I had found um, a physical copy of the contract um, in the archives, um, and I haven't yet. So I don't know what the um, rules were about, for instance, breach of contract, uh, what would be the consequences um, if uh, someone wasn't doing what they were supposed to. Um, it certainly seems to me that uh, most were willing at least to take some direction. Um, and I never see Horton or the Ministry of Supply go beyond strong language. That's what I would have to say about that. Okay. Um, Sally Horrocks. Sally. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a comment to add to the discussion that's been going on that my sense from things that I've worked on and my PhD students have worked on is that quite often, even important, if you did the work you were allocated, you could get away with doing some of the other stuff that mm. you were interested in that you were being told not to do on the side, um, at least until um, the accountants came flooding in and privatization and everything. Um, in the more recent past. So it, it, you wouldn't necessarily have to be the status of Lord Adrian, who was Chancellor of Leicester University, where I work, when it became a university. So I'm always interested to hear more about him. Um, you wouldn't necessarily need to be of that status to be slightly defiant, but other people probably had to do it by not taking a lunch break or whatever to keep sure. going things that they had been told um, should, should stop. Um, maybe that was less during the war than it was in the 50s and 60s, but um, people had had targets, but they also had fantastic equipment to work with and a bit of a, a degree of autonomy because they weren't they weren't having to account for every five minutes of their time, whereas sure. um, post privatization and, and changes in to new public sector management. Um, everyone was much more regulated. Ah, that's a compelling explanation. And I wonder too, if um, the scarcity of skilled labor in chemistry might have played a role. Um, you can get a little bit more um, freedom if they can't really afford to fire you, right? Okay. Um, Alex. Alex Angerkofer. Yes, so was Ho correct? The, the soldier that was captured in Tunisia, was he correct? Was the Taboon or rather the uh, Trollon uh, indeed a thousand times more toxic than the diisopropyl fluorophosphate that the British worked with? Yes, he was. Do you know, do you happen to know what the mechanism is of the toxicity? Of the toxicity, yes, it's um, a mostly uh, irreversible acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Okay. Um, as and that's that's true for um, all of the agents I talked about today. Okay. Um, John Walker says that Portland was never never privatized. Uh, let's take that offline. Uh, JV Field next. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for a, a great and coherent story. Um, I was interested in your having to work with classified sources because I'd done some work myself which involved classified documents or declassified documents, I should say, right. or in the case of American ones, so heavily redacted that we got about a quarter of what we were asking for. And they'd even removed the names of the people who were the reason we'd asked for the document in the first place, which we thought was rather funny. Um, but 
I was working on signals intelligence, which of course was done only at one secret establishment. Whereas you've got lots of sources outside Port and Down. I wondered what proportion you were working with classified documents, because I found the problem with classified ones was that they referred you to other classified ones. Right. And I ended up writing a few rather acid paragraphs in the introduction, explaining which documents we would have liked to have read. Exactly. Um, the answer to your question is very easy. I am working with 100% uh, declassified documents at this point. Um, the timeline of my project had a lot to do with that decision. Um, I knew that I needed to get these sources in time for finishing my PhD degree. Um, and in the United States, a FOIA request might take years to answer and result in exactly the kind of very, very, very heavily redacted documents um, that you've just described. Um, I will note that um, occasionally, if you make a FOIA request to multiple different institutions, you might get documents that are redacted differently. Uh, yes, um, we, did, we, did, we did that too, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a, a pro tip that I uh, received from another historian um, who has worked a lot with um, classified sources. And and it makes sense. A different institution would have uh, their own uh, idiosyncratic idea of what kind of information is dangerous that wouldn't necessarily overlap perfectly um, onto um, what another institution would think. Right. OK, so uh, as I use my prerogative to ask the first question, I'll use my prerogative to ask the last question. Um, and that is. Did any of the decryption of German signals from Bletchley Park, at Bletchley Park, well, deal uh, with these chemical weapons? Because I mean, Hitler was mm -hmm. going on saying, well, I've got these super weapons, we're gonna sort of snatch victory from the jaws of defeat as the Russians were coming in from the East and the Anglo-Americans, French from the, uh, from the West. Um, now I've always assumed that that was simply sort of desperate rhetoric, but if, he, if they did have these sort of, shells full of these agents. I mean, it might not have been so entirely far-fetched uh, even in the bunker in the last day. So was Bletchley Park, when a signal from Bletchley Park actually telling you, um, uh, actually telling the people involved something about what the Nazis were up to in terms of these agents? I haven't found any examples of that. Um, and uh, it's something that I'll continue to look out for. Um, in the last months and days of the war, there were a lot of um, two things going on. One, you note the um, rhetoric of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat, uh, threats to uh, go forward with large-scale chemical warfare. It wouldn't have been very feasible um, at this point, um, just because the German uh, war apparatus was so, so run down. So that's one possible set of communications that could have been um, flying around at this time period. Another is just orders to dismantle um, plants, right? Um, especially um, uh, the Tabin and Sarin plants in Eastern Germany ahead of the Soviet advance. Um, there are, there's a lot of movement of these pilot plants um, of these chemical stocks um, of these munitions that lay ready for use in the last days of the war simply because they wanted to get them out of the way of the advancing Soviet army. So I could also see how um, Germans were sending coded messages about these activities as well. Um, I haven't found traces of them in the archive, however. Okay, now having said last question, there's another last question from Vivian Kuat. Vivian. Yes, hi, sorry, it took me a long time to type my question, which is why it comes after your last question. Um, I, I missed the first part of your talk because I was stuck in traffic, so I, I hope I'm not asking a question which doesn't make any sense uh, after what you've said, but a lot of what I've read, in particular by Ul Schmidt uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, on, in his work on Porton Down, mm -hmm. suggested to me that the um, secrecy surrounding a lot of 
this sort of research that you talked about led to a lack of peer review and that often contributed to poor methodology um, in science even when it was done by top scientists and I was just wondering if it's something you found evidence of in the research you did in the work you did in the archives. That's very interesting. I'm going to say that I haven't found uh, evidence of that. And I think um, one explanation for why I haven't is that in the British context and the German context, the ones that I pay the most attention to in my research, um, institutions are uh, relatively well connected to one another. So the uh, physiology laboratory is working very closely with um, labs in chemistry and biochemistry at Cambridge, who in turn are working very closely with scientists at Horton. Um, now in the German case, it's a little bit different. It breaks down um, by institution, but again, you have um, different labs at IG Farben uh, working on synthesis and then very quickly working on toxicology. Um, and there's a way in which they can correct each other's work. Um, that's just uh, one possible uh, explanation and, and one uh, possible way that you may still have gotten um, feedback, corrections, and uh, so on um, from, you know, even under conditions of secrecy. There's also the role of um, espionage, uh, conventional and uh, industrial um, researchers would pay attention to some of the patent literature, to some of the scientific literature to try to get um, ideas of what sorts of uh, research problems were considered hot topics um, at the time. Um, and sometimes it meant that they were looking at a uh, significant lull in publications uh, where there had been a steady stream of them. Um, so there were ways of working around um, the normal, um, I mean, dare I say the normal scientific openness, I shouldn't put it that way, but uh, working around the slowing down of um, exchange of scientific information um, that happened in the context of World War II. Okay, thank you. So with that, I, I will bring things to an end. The next seminar in this series will be in June rather than May, because we decided with the ICHC meeting in Vilnius, in May to shift this to, to June. Uh, and just remains, remains for me to thank uh, everybody who's been involved in bringing this uh, seminar to the screen, so to speak. It's a surprisingly large team that requires to, to manage this sort of slightly wayward technology we have from uh, time to time. And that's Rob Johnson, Anna Simmons, Caroline Cobold, Co Caroline Cobold Becky Martin, Chris Campbell, and Joe Hedison. But of course, most of all, Alice McManus for giving us such a wonderful seminar and a promote, provoking a, a really, really good discussion. So thank, thank you, Alison. Thank you very much again for the invitation, all of the behind the scenes work and your excellent questions as well. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Well, have a good evening, stroke afternoon, stroke night, depending where you are in, in the world. Okay, thank you. <laughs>